we've been looking at the Puritans coming to America after having seen the Pilgrims come. Uh, we've got these two different groups, uh, and they both come from uh, the same country. They both come for similar reasons. Uh, so we want to take some time to look at the Pilgrims and the Puritans and to uh, see how it is it that they are uh, alike and how are they different. First, we're going to see the uh, contrasts between the two, and I'm going to call them separatists and Puritans because technically the, the Pilgrims would include the strangers as well as the saints. So uh, we'll call the separatists and Puritans. That distinguishes between the two groups and their attitude toward the Church of England while they were in England. Okay, and uh, so it separates their their history a little bit. So first of all, uh, we want to uh, look at uh, the separatists, uh, position by position, and then the Puritans as well. So here we have it. Uh, here's a map of the area in which they live. There's Plymouth, where the, the Pilgrims first settled. Up here is Boston, which becomes the leading city of the Puritans. So they live in similar areas. Now, when we think about the separatists, we know that they were few in number. The first ship that came over only has around 100 people. And they got some more after that, but remember, um, the Puritans, whereas the Pilgrims came by hundreds, the Puritans came by thousands, and so they were very numerous. So at the beginning, 105, and uh, the Puritans, 20 to 30,000 ended up coming. I know the contrast is simply when they came, uh, and that is that the uh, separatists came early in the 1620s, and the Puritans came a little bit later in the 1630s, only a decade apart, but uh, that time frame separates them a little bit. The separatists were generally poor. They were working class people. That was one of the problems when they went to Holland they could not find jobs for skilled laborers, and they had to uh, work at uh, jobs that were below what their skills were, uh, and not very well paying. Uh, the, the Puritans, on the other hand, were generally upper class and upper upper class. So they were a little more wealthy. Not necessarily wealthy, but a little, a little better off. Uh, most of them own land in England, so they uh, had more money. The separatists were, uh, and by some standards, uneducated. Now, they were more educated than most people, but by uneducated, we mean they didn't have a college degree. They did not have a college education. It was only what uh, they were taught at home primarily. Uh, they certainly could read and uh, read a lot, but uh, didn't have a degree. Uh, the Puritans, on the other hand, were university educated. Many of them were educated at uh, Cambridge or Oxford. Next, the separatists' attitude toward the state church was different than the Puritans. What was their attitude? By the state church, we mean the Church of England. What was the separatist attitude toward the Church of England? Mohammed? They didn't like it. Okay. Did the Puritans like it? The Puritans didn't like it either, so there's something more to it than not just liking it. You know, the separatists wanted to separate completely from the church, but the Puritans just wanted to change things about it. Exactly. So the separatists were called it because they wanted to separate. From the Church of England had their own congregation, whereas the Puritans uh, were loyal to the state church. They thought they could purify it from within. They thought it, they could change it from within. That, in fact, would uh, change as time goes on, as they come over to America, especially. All right, everybody, everybody understand that? See the difference? Okay, next, the separatists relationship to the monarchy. 
What was their relationship to the king? Uh, you might be surprised to find that the separatists considered themselves uh, loyal to the English monarchy. They favored the English monarchy, even though the king had persecuted them, even though the king had driven them out. They still uh, favored the idea of a king, at least, favored the monarchy. So what would you suppose the Puritan attitude was toward the English monarchy, if we're looking at contrasts? Sally, they didn't like the monarchy, in fact, we could say they hated the English monarchy. Uh, can you think of anything that we talked about, I believe, yesterday that might have uh, given them cause for hating the English monarchy? A couple things we talked about yesterday that happened. Which one, Michaela? Okay, the king was trying to tax their land. What would be another one? The Puritans were in Parliament. And then they weren't? Yeah, the king dissolved Parliament. Yeah, that's what you were getting at. Yes, I thought you were getting, wanted, wanted to get there. I just try to push you along a little bit. All right, so they hated the English monarchy. Next, the uh, separatists were rather tolerant of religious dissent. What do we mean by that? That they were tolerant of religious dissent. Do I have an idea what that means? Are there words there that you don't know? You don't know the word tolerant? You don't know the word dissent? What is it that we I don't know what dissent means. Dissent. Okay, what's dissent? Dissent is what you have when you know use a deodorant. No. What does it mean? What is dissent? What's dissension? You know that word? No? All right. Michaela, do you know what dissent is? Mm, no? Uh, no? Dissent is not uh, looking down or persecuting. Dissent is simply disagreeing. So if, uh, you know, the class plans to do something and uh, Jessica says, I'm not going to do that. So she is dissenting from what everybody else wants to do. And then, you know, you can punish her if you want, whatever. But, mm -hmm. but the separatists wouldn't have. They were tolerant of religious dissent. So what does that mean, practically? What does that mean in their relation, about their relationship with people? Now that you know what dissent means, you know what tolerant means. You know what religious means. <laughs> Put it all together, and what does this statement indicate? What's it mean, Brady? Are you stuck on the word of? <laughs> what what word is it you don't know now that we've gone over it? Do you not know the word tolerant? Mm -hmm. Stephen. They were like fine if someone didn't have the same religion as them, like they didn't treat them worse. Right, and same. we're talking about variations within Christianity. But if someone didn't believe exactly the way they did, they were okay with that. They weren't for persecuting people, throwing them in jail if they didn't agree. And this comes from uh, their background of being thrown in jail because they were the dissenters. They were the dissenters in England. And so they learned from that, and, uh, and, and probably from being in Holland as well, because Holland uh, did not uh, persecute people for believing something different. Uh, so what, whatever it was, uh, uh, they were not people that uh, were intolerant toward other religious views. They allowed different views. Okay? Now, in contrast, the Puritans were intolerant of diverse opinions. Are there any words there you don't know? So even if you were in mostly agreement with Puritan leadership, if there was any particular thing uh, about which you disagreed, that might cause a problem. So they were pretty intolerant. All right, so big difference there. Uh, another contrast is that the separatists were forced out of England.
they had to leave uh, or be imprisoned, they would be persecuted. Whereas the Puritans left voluntarily. The king didn't drive them out. It was directly. They left on their own to get away from what the king was doing. And the last contrast is simply where they live. Separate this settled in Plymouth. And the Puritans settled in Salem and Boston. Any questions about the contrast between the two groups? Can you keep them straight? Any questions? Okay, I see a few people still writing. Hopefully you're writing this and not a note to somebody. Alright, now, how are they similar? And, and the comparisons are much stronger than the contrasts. First of all, they agreed in living a simple lifestyle. What do you think we mean by that? What's a simple lifestyle? <laughs> what do you think, Stephen? Woke up, worked, ate, uh, spent time with family, and then slept. It's like nothing really exciting happened. So they were boring people? Is that what you're saying? Uh, not really, but they could be. They could be. <laughs> okay. So. You're saying they kept their their schedule pretty simple. Get up, work, go to bed. Yeah. Like it okay. All right. What else, Michael? You talk louder. I, I suspect that we're not picking you up. They didn't have like luxuries. They had like. And they were satisfied with that. To just have enough. To live on. They weren't concerned about uh, buying luxurious items. Jessica? Well, in, in fact, in England, the Puritans uh, still uh, lived that way. They lived simply. They, Even though they had more money, even though they had land, they weren't the kind of people that just bought more to have more, you know, build big houses just you know, so you could have more. So they, they believed in living that way. And in working enough to get what you need, but not working more than you need to just to get more stuff. So, I don't know, what, what group in America today believes in living simply like that, not just working to get more stuff? And I'm not comparing them in any other way to the Puritans and Pilgrims, but uh, who, who, in, who today is known for living a simple lifestyle? Not concerned about stuff. Caleb? Yeah, the Amish, right? They live very simply. Now, they live more simply, maybe than what we, any of us, would, would be happy with. But, but at least they don't. They don't believe in, in doing, doing things, working in order to get more stuff. And, and that's how they lived. They lived a simple lifestyle. They didn't uh, believe in, in uh, you know, gathering a lot of, of, of jewelry, you know, accumulating gold and silver. Uh, they were known as hard workers, but they worked for what they needed not for what they didn't need. Okay, is that clear, everybody? Do you know anybody like that besides the Amish? You know, I, you know, I don't want to ask you to name any names, but you know, think, do you know any families that you would say live simply by choice just because they don't want to accumulate a lot of stuff? Well, something to think about. Okay, let's talk about the, the religious comparisons. How are they uh, similar in the practice of their religion, let's say? Uh, one similarity was the prominence of the sermon. So, when they met together, the uh, number one thing on the agenda was to listen to a sermon. Now, how is that different from the Roman Catholic Church from which they came originally? 
you know, as the Church of England broke away from the Roman Catholic Church, uh, and as the Puritans and uh, as separatists and other reform groups uh, even wanted to go further than the Church of England, how how is the prominence of the sermon different than what it had been in their experience in the Roman Catholic Church? What was the prominent feature of the Roman Catholic service? There were only one there only went Catholic for one service, the commitment. Um, okay, but what, what, I, what I'm looking for is in the service, what was the, the focus? The homily? Uh, no, that would be the, kind of the same as the sermon. That was not the focus in the uh, Roman Catholic Church. Uh, well, I could go into a lot of reasons for that as to what was actually going on, but what was the focus? Um, what, what one in particular? Uh, they don't call it that. Yeah, the Eucharist or Mass. That was the focus in the, the, the Roman Catholic Church service. So when you went to a Roman Catholic Church service, you're going there for the Mass. In fact, they even call it. Sometimes it's called whole service. Mass, right? I'm going to Mass. Because well, that's the focus. But for the Separatists and the Puritans, why are they going? They're going to hear sermons. Now, there's other stuff going on, but that's the primary focus, is the sermon, okay? Uh, next, uh, there was a confidence in rebirth. What do we mean by rebirth? So what does rebirth refer? Sarah, so what does rebirth refer? Have you ever heard that word that word before? Rebirth? Yeah, salvation. What, or what's another word we might use? It's not somewhere to rebirth. Megan? Regeneration is not similar to rebirth, but it's the same idea that you're regenerated. Or what did Jesus say to Nicodemus? You must be born again. Rebirth. Now, so what are they saying here? When they're saying they have confidence in rebirth, what do you think they mean by that? Confidence in rebirth. Any ideas? Michaela. Exactly. They believe that they can know that they have been born again, that they've been saved. You follow? You understand now what, what those terms mean now? They have confidence that they they can know that they have salvation. Now, again, what's different about that than from uh, the background that they had in the Roman Catholic Church? Could you know that in the Roman Catholic field? No. You can't know that you actually are making it to heaven until you die and see if you get there or not. And, and quite likely, you're going to have to go to purgatory first to get to spend time <coughs> getting... Uh, the, the sins burned off that, that uh, you know, outweigh the good things you've done. All right, so this is this is kind of a new thing. That's why I'm mentioning it here because this was distinguishing uh, uh, from other religious thinking, and especially the Roman Catholic thinking. All right, so they had a confidence in rebirth. They felt you could know that you had been born again. All right, any questions? The next thing that they were believing in common was what's called covenant theology. <clears throat> what does the word covenant mean? Joey. Agreement. Pardon me? Agreement. Agreement. Yeah, that's a, a pretty good word for it. Uh, and so what does it mean in terms of theology? What do they mean by covenant theology? What do they see as the most important agreement, if you will, that there is? Who would be the two parties in the most important covenant, Joey? God and man. Exactly, God and man. And they saw the whole history of redemption, beginning with the Garden of Eden, as a series of covenants between God and man. All right, and we could go through them all, but we don't want to take the time to do that. But, but every time God interacts with man, he, he establishes a covenant with them. 
and in the uh, the advent of Christ, and then his death and resurrection, what covenant did he establish with man? What's it called? Got an idea, Joey? Oh, no. Lahana? The new covenant. <clears throat> Which means there must have been an old covenant. And what was the old covenant? <clears throat> What, what else can we call the Old Covenant? Who gave the people the Old Covenant? You know, from God, but through whom? No, not the Old Covenant. Lahana? The Mosaic Covenant, the Mosaic Law. So the Old Testament Law was the Old Covenant. You know, before that there was Noahic Covenant, the Abrahamic Covenant, and so on. But there's no, no, the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Law. And now Jesus comes and establishes the New Covenant. And so they emphasize this idea of being a part of the covenant. They're part of the family. You know, we talk about the family of God, but they talk about as being part of this covenant, this relationship between themselves and God. And then they also saw that as having an effect on the relationship with one another. Okay, but they emphasize covenant theology, that they're part of the covenant. Any questions? Okay, another similarity is what's called Sabbatarian. They were Sabbatarian. <clears throat> uh, does anybody know what that word means? Sabbatarian? Michaela? They believed in the Sabbath day. But so doesn't everybody believe in the Sabbath day? And to some respect, to some degree. But what, what more did they believe that made them different from everybody else or from many people at least. What they believe about the Sabbath. <clears throat> Michaela. You, you need to speak louder, please. You shouldn't work on the Sabbath. Alright. Anything else? Lahana? Keep it holy. And what did they mean by that? What did they mean by keeping the Sabbath holy? It's set apart as a day of rest and also something else. <clears throat> they put more into the word holy than just set apart for rest. What else did they think was a big part of the Sabbath? Is meditating on God, meditating on God's word. Uh, that the whole day was to be set apart for God. So that meant uh, no recreation, uh, that meant no work, obviously, that everything is focused on uh, all parts of the day being for God. Okay, you follow that? Uh, so I would imagine that all of your churches are much more liberal-minded concerning the Sabbath than what they were. Uh, the Amish probably would be closer in some ways, although I'm not sure if they were playing the games or not, but uh, uh, the, the Puritans would not have uh, allowed the playing of any games on the Sabbath. It was purely for focusing on God. All right, any questions about Sabbatarian or Sabbatarianism, sometimes it's called? <clears throat> Uh, next, they, they both agreed that there should be preparation of biblically sound ministers. That in other words, uh, not just anybody should get up and be teaching the Bible. You had to be prepared educationally. You had to go to school and learn uh, Hebrew and Greek uh, and, and probably Latin uh, in order to uh, study the, learn how to study the Bible so that you could uh, teach it accurately. So they wanted biblically sound ministers. Not only in education, but that they would agree with the doctrines of the, the Puritans and the Pilgrims and the Separatists. Okay, any questions about that? It's kind of funny today, in, in, in some churches uh, I've, I've seen that uh, they almost they require uh, some kind of 
kind of graduate school education, like seminary, you know, master's degree, um, and some go on for a doctorate degree in their pastoring churches. I see other churches in which the other persons of pastors is, is just a high school graduate. So it's kind of interesting in different churches to see what the expectations are today. But they wanted people that were trained. All right, any questions about these things that they had in common? Before we go on to the uh, theology that they had in common, I want us to <coughs> excuse me, take a minute to uh, just familiarize yourself with some of the names. There's nothing for you to write down, uh, but just so when you see the name, you'll you'll maybe recognize it. Uh, one of the Puritans that we're going to look at is John Cotton. Uh, he was educated in Cambridge. Uh, these are some of the things he wrote and some of the facts of his life. He was in, he was in the Church of England, uh, but he was forced by Archbishop Laud, remember him, uh, served as pastor of First Congregational Church in Boston almost 20 years, and we'll get to the exile of Roger Williams and Ann Hutchinson later. Uh, Thomas Hooker we'll talk about later, also educated at Cambridge, and you can see uh, he left for the same reason, was in Holland, came to Massachusetts Bay, uh, eventually moved to Connecticut, helped write the Constitution for Connecticut. Richard Mather went to Oxford, oh, rivalry there between Cambridge and Oxford. He wrote the Bay Psalm book, which is the first book printed in America, and that book contains what? Michael, what's that book contain? Katie? Psalms. Psalms. How'd you know that? Oh, it's, okay, it's, it's Bay Psalm book. Okay. And what are Psalms? Jessica, what are Psalms? Yeah, what are, what are those? Well, they're like poems. What else are they like? Stephen? Songs? They're songs. They're to be sung. sung. Yeah. Psalms are songs. And the, uh, the Puritans believe that that's the only thing you should be singing in church, in your meeting, is psalms. Not made up psalms, like hymns. Uh, the separatists believe that as well. And there's still some churches today that uh, only will sing psalms in their church service. Have you ever been to one like that? Uh, there's some other places. Yeah. Where? Where? Um, yeah. Oh, the Wesleyan Methodist Church. Okay. Okay. I, I didn't remember that, uh, that they said that too. Uh, let's see, then we have, uh, we see his history. Uh, Roger Williams, Cambridge man. Uh, he was in the Anglican Church also, moved towards separatism, came to New England, uh, and uh, was eventually expelled from Massachusetts Bay, started the first Baptist Church in America. Uh, then we have Thomas Shepard. Uh, he wrote a lot. This only has one thing here, but uh, you can find a lot of his writings today. Went to Cambridge. Uh, same kind of history. Increase Mather. Went to Harvard. So now we have people graduating from the school in America. Uh, here's some of his writings. Uh, he's the son of Richard Mather that we have here. So his name is Increase Mather. Uh, he was pastor of North Church, Boston. And we'll talk about the halfway covenant later. Solomon Stoddard went to Harvard, and you can see some of his history there. Uh, he's a grandfather of Jonathan Edwards, whom we'll feature later. <clears throat> Cotton Mather is the son of Increase Mather. Can you tell who Increase Mather, uh, whose daughter Increase married? Whose daughter did Increase Mather marry? John Cotton? Yeah, so they called the son Cotton Mather. He wrote this huge work on called Magnalia Christi Americana, the history of Christian America, uh, and uh, you know it's you know, up through the early 1700s, and it's still a pretty thick book. Uh, graduated from Harvard at age 15. Uh, and you can see some of the things. He was uh, had a part in the Sin of Charles, which we'll look, look at later as well. Okay, so those are some of the Puritan names that we'll come to know as we move along, and hopefully you'll recognize as we go to. 
Um, tomorrow, we're going to delve into the theology of the separatists and Puritans, because they were in agreement on that. So the contrast we saw are relatively minor. They're in agreement in most things. And eventually, the, uh, the Pilgrim settlement kind of gets swallowed up by the Puritans, because they're in agreement anyway. And by the time the Puritans are here for a while, they're no longer really Puritans as far as purifying the Church of England. They're really separatists, because they're, they're, they're not in England anymore. And they start churches here that are really separate from the Church of England. So we'll find out what their theology is tomorrow, and hopefully that will provide some uh, uh, interest and uh, maybe even some discussion. And I'll, I'll give you a hint. What they believe is the same thing that Pastor Kyle was talking about last week. Yes, that nefarious system. We'll get into tomorrow. All right, make sure you're looking over your notes day by day because we're accumulating information as we go along. And it's important that you not wait until the, day, the night before a test and quiz to try to learn it. Don't forget about your reading project due tomorrow as well.